Medistand. Understanding Medicine. I am Professor Azizur Rahman, and if you have attended my last video on mitral stenosis, so this is just going to be a revision, uh, but it is will be in the form of a quiz. Now, of course, I am not testing your knowledge, but in this interesting format, I will be showing you some questions and will allow you some time to come up with an answer. You can pretend that you are attending a live session and then I will display the answer and if needed we will have some discussion on that also. So this is uh, a just a, a kind of revision and you will benefit from this presentation uh, most if you have watched the earlier one also which covers mitral stenosis, its pathophysiology, hemodynamic changes, auscultatory finding, echo finding and the treatment. So it is very very strongly recommended that you first watch the video on mitral stenosis and then come here which is mitral stenosis a quiz. Uh, let's now start with the quiz. Uh, which one of the following is the characteristic murmur of mitral stenosis? Multiple options will appear and you have to figure out which one is the classical murmur which we hear in cases of mitral stenosis. A pan systolic murmur or an early diastolic murmur or a systolic ejection murmur or a mid diastolic murmur or a continuous murmur which is heard both during systole as well as diastole. Which one is correct? If you know the stuff, I think it should be very, very easy. Just as a clue, which phase of the cardi cycle blood flows from left atrium to the left ventricle through mitral valve? It is the diastole. So if the valve is stenosed and the blood is not flowing easily, it should of course be a diastolic murmur. So the correct answer is mid-diastolic murmur. In a most typical case, there would be actually a mid-diastolic murmur which will have pre-systolic accentuation. That means toward the end of the diastole, just before the next systole, the murmur will increase in intensity. This is because the pressure gradient between left atrium and left ventricle will increase due to left atrial contraction which occurs just at the end of diastole. Now you will also understand that if there is no left atrial contraction which happens in cases of uh, atrial fibrillation which is actually a common complication of mitral stenosis so in that case that pre-systolic accentuation will disappear. So classical would be mid diastole murmur. If there is a fibrillation, just a mid diastole murmur. If there is no fibrillation, there will be pre-systolic uh, accentuation. So this was the question one. Let's now proceed to question number two. Which statement is true regarding atrial fibrillation complicating mitral stenosis? I uh, covered in my lecture that in cases of mitral valve disease because of the dilatation of atria uh, and also because of the fibrotic process, the sinus node does not remain stable and whenever the SA node is not stable, uh, there is uh, that encourages ectopic rhythm and one such ectopic rhythm is atrial fibrillation. So atrial fibrillation is fairly common complication of mitral stenosis. Whenever somebody develops atrial fibrillation, there is usually worsening of symptoms because atrial fibrillation means uh, faster heart rate and that means shorter di uh, diastole, that means further increase in left atrial pressure and pulmonary edema. So now let's see the statements. You have to find out which one is true. Patient may develop pulmonary edema. 
pre-systolic ejection murmur may disappear. Pre-systolic uh, accentuation of the murmur may disappear when there is atrial fibrillation. Risk of thromboembolism is increased and pulse becomes irregularly irregular or all are true. This should be easy. Of course, pulmonary edema is one of the complications of mitral stenosis because of increased left atrial pressure, which is uh, uh, transmitted backward. Peristolic accentuation just disappears in atrial fibrillation because there is no left atrial contraction. Atrial fibrillation in itself is a risk for thromboembolic phenomenon, and when that develops over mitral stenosis, of course. This statement is also true. Pulse becomes irregularly irregular. That is you know, something you must have learned in third year that that is a feature of atrial fibrillation. So all are true. All are true regarding this is the scenario of atrial fibrillation developing in a case of mitral stenosis. The medical treatment of mitral stenosis may include which one of this? Beta blockers, digoxin, diuretics, warfarin, all of the above. Why would one want to use beta blockers to reduce heart rate? Because faster the heart, shorter the diastole, more is the left atrial pressure. Digoxin when there is atrial fibrillation beta blockers do not work very well then we have to use digoxin to control heart rate diuretics we have to use when patient goes into pulmonary edema or just simple pulmonary congestion warfarin patients may be prone to develop thromboembolic phenomenon and though we have a newer generation of uh, anticoagulants which are considered safer than warfarin and maybe a little bit more effective also less risk of bleeding but when there is valvular heart disease warfarin is still the treatment of choice an anticoagulant of choice so the correct answer is all of the above right if you all agree we can move to the next slide Which one of the following does not reflect severity of mitral stenosis? We can often judge the severe severity of mitral stenosis on history and examination. So you have to tell me which of the following, which is going to appear now, which does not reflect the severity of mitral stenosis. Severity of dyspnea extent of crepitation, that means whether crepitations are heard only on the basis or they are heard in the mid zones also maybe up to the apices also sometimes or the intensity of the murmur how loud the murmur is duration of murmur the length of uh, the murmur and proximity of opening snap to p2 okay that means the how close is opening snap to p2 i explained in my lecture that normally we do not have opening snap because normally opening of mitral valve does not create any sound but in mitral stenosis because the the driving force the opening force is left atrial pressure which is very high in this case so the valve opens with a click and that sound is called opening snap which one of the following does not reflect the severity of mitral stenosis It is the intensity of murmur. Sometimes a beginner, the student would think if the murmur is very loud, the stenosis must be very severe. In a way that is actually correct to a certain extent because a narrow valve would cause more uh, turbulence and would cause more, uh, I mean a louder uh, murmur, but only if the valve is pliable. In the natural process of uh, rheumatic mitral stenosis, mitral valve may become non-pliable. 
that means it doesn't move at all it just like becomes a membrane with a hole and since there is no movement no vibration the murmur may be actually very very faint so intensity of murmur has got nothing to do with the severity of mitral stenosis in some cases in very advanced cases murmur may be very hard to uh, appreciate because it is very faint but the stenosis is very very severe uh, severity of dyspnea of course most stenosis will be more dyspnea extent of crepitation also means more left atrial pressure more pulmonary edema the more uh, higher crepitations duration of a murmur yes this is this is important because tight stenosis would mean that left atrium continue to count, uh, to empty its content into the left uh, ventricle till the diastole is uh, the entire diastole is finished so longer the murmur means the stenosis is very severe proximity of opening snap to p2 if left atrial pressure is very high and the well will very open very fast and opening snap will be very close to pulmonary component so proximity has got uh, uh, very very strong relationship with the severity of mitral stenosis. So the correct answer is that the intensity of the murmur does not relate with the severity of mitral stenosis. Okay, now we're moving to the next question. The murmur of mitral stenosis is characterized by all of the following except that it is best heard on mitral area. Here. It radiates to the axilla. It is rough and rumbling in character. It increases in duration during uh, it, it increases during tachycardia. Then the murmur increases during tachycardia. It is better appreciated with bell of the stethoscope. So the murmur of mitral stenosis is characterized by all of the following except that which one is not true. It radi radiates to the axilla. That is not true. Murmur of mitral regurgitation typically radiates to the axilla. And murmur of mitral stenosis is heard only on the mitral area it may be heard in the surrounding area also if it is loud but it does not actually radiate to any direction and it is best heard with the bell uh, rest of the features i think uh, are already discussed so the correct answer is that the murmur of mitral stenosis does not radiate to the axilla so this is the correct answer all right you're doing very well so far. The percutaneous transseptal mitral commissurotomy, which is abbreviated as PTMC, in mitral stenosis is contraindicated except when there is. So this is a little tricky statement. This procedure is contraindicated except when there is a crore in the left atrium associated mitral regurgitation associated aortic regurgitation very tight mitral valve orifice and calcified mitral valve where you think ptmc is not indicated uh, is, is is indicated actually in all r it is contraindicated despite the fact that patient has mitral stenosis but if there is a clot in the left atrium, the procedure is contraindicated because there is a risk of dislodging the clot and producing thromboembolic phenomenon. Associated mitral regurgitation, especially if there is significant mitral regurgitation, PTMC is only going to uh, correct a stenotic part and patient will continue to have symptoms. So uh, this procedure is contraindicated because patient will not be benefited. This patient would need a replacement of valve or repair of valve associated aortic regurgitation the same thing is applicable here if patient has got aortic valve disease uh, then patient's symptoms might not be uh, relieved once that patient undergoes ptmc very tight mitral valve uh, orifice calcified mitral valve i think my answer would be very tight mitral valve orifice 
if the valve that is in fact the reason why uh, we want to do PTMC that is why we want to open it so if patient has tight mitral stenosis but none of the contraindications exist that patient would be a right candidate for PTMC okay moving to the next This is a little funny. What is the commonest heart disease in college going students? Is it congenital heart disease or is it rheumatic heart disease or is it ischemic heart disease or is it ischemic heart disease? You know what I mean. Right? This was just the lighter part of the story. Thank you very much. Uh, this was Professor Aziz Rahman from Madistan. I really look forward to see you in my subsequent videos. And the next one is going to be on mitral regurgitation. If you uh, watch all these videos in series, so this part of uh, your curriculum, valvular heart disease, will be completed. I have already covered uh, congenital heart disease, but uh, this is uh, uh, rheumatic heart disease and you are very likely to get a case in your examinations because these conditions do exist in our country and they are often put in the examination. So see you in my next video on mitral regurgitation. Thank you very much.